Good evening. I'm Councilmember Mitchell Brown, and I'm being joined this evening by my colleague Michael Cenziano. Uh, thank you for attending tonight's Public Safety Committee hearing to discuss the modification of the alarm code section of the Columbus City Code, Chapter 597. Copies of tonight's agenda are available at the entrance of Council Chambers. Tonight, the Support Services section of the Department of Public Safety will outline proposed changes to the Columbus City Code related to security alarms. I would now like to invite Public Safety Director Ned Pettis to provide a staff presentation of the proposed changes. Director Pettis. Good evening, Safety Chair Mitchell Brown and Council Member Stenziano. Uh, we are pleased to be here tonight to discuss the changes to Columbus City Code 597 regarding alarm systems, dealers, and users. Before we continue with the presentation and specifics, on behalf of the Department of Public Safety, I would like to thank Mayor Andrew Ginther, Council President Zach Klein, and members of Council, and the valued voters of the City of Columbus for their support. We appreciate the dedication, commitment, and the continuous pursuit of excellence by all members of the Columbus Department of Public Safety, and I commend the license section for the job they do, including the laser focus they applied to their review of and proposed updates to Title V codes. With me this evening to help answer questions about proposed changes to Columbus City Code 597 are Ramona Patz, Division Administrator for Support Services, Licensed Supervisor Jennifer Schix, and Andrew Bowden, the license officer spearheading the prospective changes being presented to you this evening. And so, members of council, Ms. Ramona Patz. Thank you, Director Pettis. I may also say good evening to Mayor Ginther, Mr. Dorian, and members of city council, and the citizens of Columbus. As Director Pettis stated, we are here to discuss proposed changes to Columbus City Code 597. Let me start by saying that the alarm code was written in the mid-1980s in an attempt to decrease the rapidly rising number of false alarm runs our police force and fire department were responding to. It was during this time home alarm systems started becoming standard in new homes and easily accessible to existing ones. We all now know drastic changes in technology has changed from the mid-80s up to today. We now have wireless cameras, smartphone alarm notifications, incredibly sensitive motion detection, and so much more. However, during those 30-odd years, Chapter 597 has only received one major revision, and that was in 2004. Just think only about your cell phone and how much it has changed since then. False alarms unduly burden the limited resources of our first responders. This puts our residents at a greater risk when the police and fire department are not able to respond as quickly to a real emergency because they are tied up with false alarms. The purpose of the changes we are proposing will bring our ordinance closer to the industry standard models and establish some reasonable expectations of alarm users to ensure that they are accountable for the proper use of their alarm systems. That being said, I would like to introduce License Officer Andrew Bowden, who has a short presentation for us today. Thank you, Ms. Potts. Councilman Stenziato and Councilmember Brown, um, to present to you some information here about chapter 597 of the Columbus City Code. The purpose of the alarm user license is to identify the responsible person who is using an alarm system and to maintain information about this person so they may be efficiently and effectively contacted by the public safety personnel during an emergency situation. The purpose of the alarm dealer license is to ensure that those companies in the business of installing, selling, or monitoring alarm systems meet generally accepted industry requirements for the safety of the citizens of Columbus. The alarm code, Chapter 597, was originally established in the 1970s and hasn't gone, undergone a major renovation since 1998. The fees set in this chapter were last updated in 2003, so it's been quite a while since this chapter's been addressed. 
The major faults that are in the current code is that they are not adapted for the current technology. As Ms. Pats alluded to earlier, if you put it in perspective of a cell phone, the technology has changed greatly since 1998. The current code also doesn't provide any assistance or alterations in the code for the elderly citizens of Columbus. Uh, the elderly citizens of Columbus are one of the most heavily uh, used alarm system populations that we have. The current code doesn't allow for a full investigative authority by the license section. When we're investigating false alarms, the cooperation of the alarm companies is crucial to get to the bottom of any faulting alarm systems that we have. The standards that for the alarm systems that are in the current code are out of date. The proposed code changes should address some of those issues. Alarm dealer requirements are not well worded and are confusing to the alarm companies and we've straightened out some of that under the proposed changes. And further, the alarm agents are, have been deemed unnecessary by our office. That technology is being addressed, or the alarm agents are the employees of the alarm companies, and with current upgrades in technology to the alarm companies, they're able to achieve at a much lower cost what our, our office is able to achieve as far as background checks and ensuring compliance with bonding and insurance. Some false alarm numbers. In the year 2016, the total number of false alarm calls to the Columbus Police Department were 47,566. Of those, approximately 2,800 were canceled. What we determined to be a canceled call is a call that's either cleared by the dispatcher as a canceled call, or what may be called a code four by a police officer who may never have arrived at scene. Of that 47,000 and some change, 34,312 of those alarm calls were actually cleared as false alarms, which is approximately 76%. If you look at the overall numbers of the calls that came into the Columbus Police Department's non-emergency line, 579,000 calls came in. Of those, over 8% of them were for alarm-related calls. And again, 76% of those overall calls were deemed to be false or not needed. So the major changes that we've made under the proposed legislation is we would now allow the licensure of an alarm system within 30 days of the date that the system is installed into a user's home. The current code requires that to be done prior to installation, and that's not a realistic expectation. We prefer to get the information from an alarm company that a system has been installed and then have time to contact that end alarm user informing them that a license is required. The new legislation would also allow an age exemption to licensing renewal fees for residents who are over the age of 70. This hopefully will help eliminate the burden of the license on those citizens. Establishment of a false alarm training class that will allow residents to remove an alarm fee if they take and pass the course. That course will be designed for the residents to become better familiar with the functionality of their alarm system and some industry standard practice. Continuing with some more of the major changes, we have better defined what is allowed as an appeal for false alarms. And we've increased the time for those appeals from 14 to 21 days. We've defined systems that are primarily operated from video feeds or are user monitored. Those would be more of the self-installed feeds that you could buy at a Home Depot, a Lowe's, maybe even a Best Buy, install those systems yourself and monitor them on your own. As we touched on earlier, we've eliminated the alarm agent licensure most of the alarm companies are completing those same tasks themselves. We've increased the alarm dealer license from one year to two year to lessen the burden on those alarm companies with complying with our legislation. We have also updated the liability policy from a quarter million dollars to a million dollars, which is industry standard across most cities. Currently, there were only three alarm companies in the city who didn't meet that million dollar standard. 
And of those three, um, they were either at half a million or three quarters of a million dollars in coverage already. Further, we're gonna require a four hour battery backup on alarm systems. This should help prevent false alarms from quick power flashes or just routine storms. This has been an industry trend over the last few years as battery technology has gotten better and better. The four hour battery backup is more of a realistic, more of a realistic uh, requirement. Alarm companies will now be required to test the alarm systems after installation. We would hope that this is being done currently, but we do find through a lot of our appeals that it is not. So an alarm, system, our alarm company will now be required to show where they have performed a test with the end user. We also have now differing rates for different alarm types due to the varied response by public safety. Different alarms require different responses of either medics, police cruisers, fire apparatus, helicopters, priority runs, and supervision such as uh, sergeants and lieutenants. This is a chart of the potential alarm user changes that we've proposed in our legislation. As you can see, there's now two categories of residential alarm user licenses, those for residents under the age of 70 and those for residents over the age of 70. The current fee for those are currently $35. The proposed fee for those under the age of 70 will increase to $45 for a new license, but will decrease to $25 for the renewal of that license. Likewise, for those over the age of 70, the license will only be $15 and we will have a no charge renewal. Commercial alarm user licenses are currently billed at $35. That fee will increase to $70 for a new license, but the renewal rate will be the same at the current $35 rate. Also, the bank alarm user license, which is currently $35, will be $55 for a new license but the renewal rate will begin be less, $25. The reasoning for this change is the upgraded technology that has been needed to be purchased from the Department of Public Safety to monitor the large number of false alarms. The alarm user false alarm fees are what an alarm user is charged after they have had false alarms. The current fees are between zero and $800 and we're proposing a change between zero and $1,000. The increase from 800 to $1,000 is only applicable on panic and burglar or panic and robbery alarms by banks. And that will only occur once they've had 10 or more false alarms within a year. The reasoning for that change is again, the technology that we, we spoke about earlier. <clears throat> the alarm agent license will go from a current charge of $50 to something that we require the alarm companies to self-monitor. When we're, when we're requiring the alarm companies to self-monitor this, we will take a random sampling from those alarm companies to make sure that their employees are bonded, insured, and have had a background check performed. The alarm dealer license or the alarm company license is a currently a $200 license. We're proposing to raise that to $400 for a new license and $250 for a renewal. With the increase in price, we've taken the license from a one-year license to a two-year license. And the licensing fees will again help us with the proposed software changes um, that we spoke of earlier. Are there any questions? A few. Uh, and when you made mention about alarm user false alarm fees for banks, you said 10 or more. So you'd have to have at least 10 false alarms before they would be charged, or is it incremental? And I, I apologize now that I'm looking at the chart. It is actually 11 or more. Um, it is incremental, but starting the increase would have the increase from $800 to $1,000 only applies on the 11th or higher alarm. Okay. A few more questions, and Administrator Patch, you can probably 
respond to this. Uh, what is the value of not requiring alarm agent licenses? Or remember your staff, that's fine. Well, I think, uh, Councilmember Brown, Anston Dion's, I think the value in this is that it's no longer needed. Uh, when this code was, in, was put into play in 1987, uh, we didn't have the technology to run background checks at that point. Uh, it was a, so now we have the agencies, the alarm agents actually have, can, can have their backgrounds done by their companies themselves. It's just, it, it actually is a layer of the process that's no longer needed. Uh, they're being bonded by their alarm dealers. Uh, they're being, background checks are being done by the alarm dealers. There's still going to be alarm agents. We're just, just no requirement for us to license them any longer because it's up to the alarm dealers now to make sure that they're bonded and background checked. Uh, also, will this code change or reduce false alarms? The, the goal is to reduce false alarms. We have asked for um, the technology to be implemented to a standard that, quite frankly, was put into place in the late 90s um, at minimum. That basic of a standard should cut down on some of the false alarms that are being presented. When, Andrew, when you talk about the different technology, what technology are we talking about specifically or a little more specifics on the technology? The, the technology is called ANSI or SIA. It's a control panel technology, which is essentially the hub of the alarm center. Uh, we require that to meet certain standards that, again, are, are at minimum late 1990 standards. That also plays into the impact on with technology on the billing process. How would that have an impact in that respect? It shouldn't have much of an impact on uh, building a new structure, for instance, because the vast majority of people are going to use a better technology than that. But we felt the need to put in a minimum base technology to require alarm companies to not activate older systems that are constantly prone to falsing. And what other cities were used as a model for this current policy change since we haven't changed it in quite some time? We looked at uh, several other cities approximately our size, Indianapolis, um, Raleigh, Baltimore were probably the big pushers in that. Um, we also looked at some other area cities such as Cincinnati and Cleveland and Pittsburgh to see what they had on the books and tried to model it from there. The ordinance was also taken from the alarm industry. They have a sample ordinance uh, of which that technology that we spoke to prior to this um, is a base minimum for what the alarm industry believes that they should be installing. Were these cities also having difficulties with false alarms? It's turning into a nationwide problem as police departments are looking to control their budgets um, and reduce waste. They view false alarms as that waste. So cities all across the nation are, including the ones I mentioned, are having a significant issue with false alarms. And what would a false alarm training class consist of? You mentioned false alarm training classes. We have a couple options. There is an internet or web-based uh, course available. Um, there is a cost to that course that would be required by the end user. Um, that course would consist of a two to three hour online presentation. It would consist of uh, responsible alarm usage, explaining to them that you know, balloons may set off your sensors, um, heating vents, curtains, pets. Um, it kind of goes over just a general overview of responsible alarm usage. It would also cover how to cancel an alarm call with the Columbus Police Department uh, or your alarm company prior to an officer's arrival. I have a strong sensitivity for our senior citizens who may or may not know how to go online and take the class. What are we going to do for them since we already have a different rate? Uh, how are they going to know how to do this? We're looking to hold some of these uh, classes and community centers around the city as well as in our own office. So you would be able to sign up to take an in-person class if the online training wouldn't work for you. Um, that in-person class May, would have a small fee associated with it as outlined in the code, but that fee would be less than what it would cost you to pay for that false alarm. The end goal being to reduce false alarms by the attendance at that class. And I take it that would be advertised so individuals who would know that if they went to buy an alarm system and they wanted to go take the classes, they would be informed on how to do that. 
what we would do is when we notified them if they've had a false alarm or on their license application, we would notify them at that time that the classes are available. Uh, the class would be, again, in lieu of paying a false alarm payment or just for general education, and you could, for lack of a better term, bank that credit for one of your false alarms. It's important since we're doing stuff for senior citizens that they have an opportunity to do this besides just online and to make sure they have an opportunity to be educated about what to do when the system isn't functioning properly. Uh, so why is there an increase for commercial alarm user licenses? We have a lot of new commercial buildings going up in Columbus, um, as along with warehouses and large buildings. Commercial buildings for the police department take longer to just clear in general. So when you have a larger, a longer police response, it necessitates a higher fee for clearing that false, that alarm if the call does indeed turn out to be false. And Andrew also provide clarity on the difference between false alarm calls and false alarms. A false alarm call is when your alarm company calls into the Columbus Police Department and requests dispatch for a false alarm event. The simple act of calling the police department does not dictate a false alarm. When the officer arrives, they make the determination of that false alarm. We do not bill it as a false alarm until the officer has notified us that there is no emergency situation when he or she arrives. So a false alarm call is the simple act of the monitoring station calling Columbus police. A false alarm is when they've actually arrived at the business or the residence and have determined that the alarm call was not valid. And would you say that the fees, uh, whether or not they actually cover the total cost for a police officer to respond and it is a false alarm? It does not. Um, the general, the fee is there <clears throat> to provide incentive for the alarm user to detour the action of false alarms, but it does not provide the city an entire recouping of the, uh, of the cost. And would you explain why the renewal period for user licenses is being reduced from two years currently to one year, given the fact that we haven't changed this in a long, long time? Correct. Our ultimate goal is to cut down on the burden of the police department by building a database of people to call in case of an emergency and keeping an accurate database with the alarm company. Um, we are in the up uh, keeping an accurate database with the alarm company of the end users, the police department will be able to more accurately and more importantly, more efficiently respond to those emergency situations and get a hold of somebody if there is an actual emergency. So provide, by providing that information yearly, our records will be much more accurate. Um, it will also assist with the Columbus's uh, CAD system, the computer-aided dispatch, um, so all of our officers and the people in our radio room will have access to this information. Thank you. Councilman Stanziano, do you have any particular questions? Thank you. Uh, I, I'm aware of this issue, and it has been uh, an ongoing problem for quite some time, especially the concerns we have with our uh, public safety forces having to respond to false alarms. Uh, obviously, that has been an issue. Uh, to my knowledge, we do not have any public speaker slips uh, on this particular subject matter. Uh, so that being said, I would like to say uh, clearly to say thank you to Director Pettis and to his staff uh, for their hard work on this initiative. I know it has taken some time to, to get to this point. Uh, certainly, I'd like to recognize my staff, Denise Fran Foster and Grant Ames and John Oswald for their assistance in preparing this evening's hearing. Uh, it's important as we follow tonight's public hearing on City Council staff and Department of Public Safety will draft an ordinance to include the proposed changes in the city code. This ordinance will then be presented to my colleagues, uh, council colleagues, for their respective approval. If members of the community have any further questions or concerns, please feel free to contact the Department of Public Safety at 614-645 8210 at 614-645-8210 or they can contact my office 
at 614-645-4605. It is important for the community to be engaged because again, we're talking about resources. So with that being said, finally, I'd like to thank the community for their engagement in tonight's proceedings. And that concludes our Public Safety Committee hearing. Thank you all and everyone have a good evening.